Bitcoin ETF mania continues, Binance still facing an uphill battle, and did you know there is more ETH staked in the blockchain than on the exchanges right now? What does that even mean? We discuss all of this and more in today's Collective Shift Weekly Recap, actionable insights, and a breakdown of the crypto market all in under 30 minutes just for you. We'll start with the market update followed by the ETF news and more. So Matt, what does the market look like? Thanks, Leon. Another green mar- uh, week for the markets with uh, Bitcoin still staying above 30,000. Uh, it's up about 1% for the week. ETH's up about 4% for the week. It actually has closed now that we're to the start of July. ETH put in its six consecutive um, monthly increase. Uh, so yeah, quite quite remarkable in, during, a, during a bear market. Uh, and we've seen Bitcoin also put in a, a positive month. So it's actually risen five out of the six months in 2023 so far. Uh, interestingly, we've seen uh, the correlation between Bitcoin and the NASDAQ. So, you know, what we're talking about here is if the NASDAQ were to go up, you know, is Bitcoin going up and vice versa? That was very strong. They were too, they were too, you know, rather tightly correlated, you know, towards the end of last year and start of this year. Interestingly, these two, you know, different vehicles are now basically uncorrelated. They're, they're almost at zero correlation. Uh, which is which is quite significant and and definitely a talking point and something to note when we always focus on on macro. It was often a very relevant for crypto markets if you go back six months ago. Uh, and these days, that correlation is definitely uh, a very soft. Now, Matt, uh, the correlation is actually significant in the market. But for those of you that might be listening out there, might be asking, Matt, what does what does a change in the correlation actually mean? Like. Uh, Bring it back down to basics for us. Yeah, so it's basically saying, yeah, if, if just overnight, if the Nasdaq went up two percent, you know, if it was if the correlation was one to one, you would see Bitcoin also go up by two percent. Um, you know, when when we we're talking six months ago or whatever, the correlation was you know zero point five percent. So you know, if if the Nasdaq went up by two percent, you know, BTC might go up by one percent. Um, and they're always very coupled, and there was a lot of reasons for that. A lot of it had to do with the influx of professional traders into the space. So a lot of the the big trading desks in the financial space had opened up crypto trading desks and they were treating it like very much like risky assets. Um, and so it's had a lot of algorithms and whatnot, trading all these BTC, re- responding to different inv- like events happening in the, in the macro environment. Uh, but now that we've seen a lot of them exit the space or withdraw, um, that, I think that's my theory as to why uh, you know, the main reason, I think there are some other smaller ones, but I think that's the main reason why we've seen this softening. Uh, so yeah, just, just something to note there. I still think, you know, does this mean we should just toss out anything to do with the economy? I still strongly disagree with that. I still think it's like imperative that we're watching the state of the economy and, and macro trends. Um, but it's interesting to see now in this, in this bear market, things, you know, really for the short term are looking pretty just uncorrelated. Well, thanks for that explanation, Matt. I'm sure some others would appreciate that uh, if you're listening to this on YouTube or on Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts. Now, Matt, let's move on to the biggest news item of the week, at least what we think at Collective Shift is the biggest news item. Uh, Coinbase has recently come out. They'll be helping uh, um, Fidelity as well as other uh, companies who have filed for Bitcoin ETFs. Um, These are the ETFs that have been amended. But Matt, I think you have the big scoop on this. What's happening with Coinbase, uh, Fidelity and the SEC and all of these ETFs? They've all come out out of the world. Yeah, as we've been talking about, you know, definitely the story of June and it will be the story of July and probably a big focus for the rest of the year. So all this you know, mania about the Bitcoin ETFs, we've, we've spoken you know, at length about why it's important. Just as a, a quick reminder, it's really just you know, significant as seen as almost a stamp of validation for the whole crypto space, but absolutely just Bitcoin at this stage and it's also you know at a legal standpoint a lot easier now for other vehicles and other sources of you know capital to now gain exposure to bitcoin if an etf was ever approved in the us or a spot etf so what happened last week basically you know the sec so everyone everyone submits their proposed etf application to the sec they get to decide whether they approve it or reject it um you know the sec actually came back rather quickly and and you know told these issuers uh, these proposed ETFs, hey, uh, there actually isn't enough detail with regards to what you're talking about um, in terms of your you know, shared surveillance agreement. Uh, basically, these new ETF issuers put in a, a thing a, to dumb it down into their into their ETF application, just to say, hey, we've got a shared sa- surveillance agreement with you know these exchanges. Uh, they didn't name the exchange, 
uh, SEC previously over the years has said, hey, like you should really, you know, we encourage you to include this in future ones. So that's what happened last month. Uh, SEC came to them last week, just said, hey, we actually need the name of the exchange. Uh, so that's come out to be Coinbase. Uh, so that is significant. There'll now be sort of, um, you know, challenges or it'll be interesting to see whether the SEC deems Coinbase as being, you know, a big enough exchange, you know, that that's relevant in, in the market for, for Bitcoin. Uh, so that's another discussion, but I suppose the takeaway like this, we can get into all the technicals and whatnot in, in the comments for any collective shift viewers out there. Um, but really the takeaway for me is it's, it's encouraging to see the SEC is like, quite engaged already in, you know, considering the, the details of these, of these applications. Um, if they wanted to reject it, they, they could have just, you know, done it straight away. Um, you know, but however, they've gone back to them asking for more details. So to me, that that's encouraging at least. Um, and as I said, July, August, September, those you know next three months will be imperative with regards to the like the prospects of a Bitcoin ETF being passed. And you know, to really dumb it down, if there is one that is approved, I strongly would expect Bitcoin price to you know go up by double digit percentages. Um, that's still you know who, who knows whether that will actually happen, but. That's why I suppose anything to do with ETF developments in the next couple of months is going to be like very important news from an investment standpoint. Now, Matt, I just wanted to bring it back. I've got a question for you here. This is slightly significant because previously when uh, these ETFs had been filed, they didn't name where they would be getting their data from or surveillance. And now, so BlackRock has kind of named Coinbase as being that partner for clarity. Um, I guess, why does this really matter? And what really happens next after this? I think it matters really just because it now allows the SEC to have all the information it needs um, to, you know, go ahead and, you know, make a decision. There might be other details in these applications that it doesn't think, you know, meets what it needs, the criteria it needs for them to approve an ETF. But at least we've got some progress here. It was interesting to see all the applicants basically refile the ETFs like very quickly, like within, you know, it was a matter of one to two days that happened last Friday. Uh, so now we're still waiting in terms of next steps. We're still waiting for, you know, the SEC to actually formally acknowledge these applications. It does this by just submitting them or, or publishing them in the federal register. And then it kicks off that, that long, potentially very long, you know, period that can get up to as many as 240 days for the SEC to finally make a decision. May not get to that stage, but, you know, it's exciting to see some, some progress, I suppose. And, just I did see before we started recording today actually marked the 10 year anniversary of when the first Bitcoin ETF was proposed. <laughs> ah, well, look at that. Jesus yeah. Christ. We've come a long way. <laughs> well, yes, yes and no. Uh, <laughs> and we're still needing, yeah, well, we're still yeah, needing that's, that's a Bitcoin right, yeah. ETF or at least a spot one. <laughs> well, that's right. That's right. Well, well we are making strides in our, our Bitcoin futures at least. Mm. I think one got launched yeah. not long ago. So it won't take long for a spot to come along here or there. Maybe you know one again, one of them will get approved, and then the other ones will slowly follow on and on. Well, thanks a lot for that market update, as well as the update on Coinbase and our Fidelity partnership there. But I wanted to come across now to Nick. Now, Nick, you've got some really interesting news um, with ETH. There is more ETH on um, the blockchain than there is on exchanges. That's pretty significant, isn't it, Nick? What do you think about this? Uh, yeah, it was um, a kind of a, a first for, for two reasons. So it was the number one that the total number of staked ETH surpassed, I think, 20 million. And then, as you said now, that the total ETH on these centralized exchanges has been eclipsed by the number of ETH that is being staked in the ecosystem. So the reason why this is so important is because I know we as a research team as well, we're really uh, looking at the ETH staking. And we sort of had the idea of once withdrawals are activated, then this may sort of de-risk ETH because now people will be able to get out of, um, you know, and withdraw their ETH. And it's especially if you're somebody with um, getting into the space, not being able to withdraw your cryptocurrency was such a big barrier. So now we're able to see that, yes, it's actually proved with some of the most aggressive staking um, and validators who want to come in and secure Ethereum um, in the last two months. I think it's been the fastest growth since uh, December 2020. So a lot of demand for ETH and a lot of uh, demand for ETH being staked, which of course can, I guess, reduce the number of ETH that can be sold right away in the market. And it's also a really good signal that people are really engaging and wanting to stake their ETH. 
Yeah. Now, now, Nick, I want to ask you, do you expect this trend to continue for more ETH being on the blockchain than actually being on the centralized exchanges? Uh, yeah, for sure. Because if we look at the total amount of ETH that is being staked, it's just about to tick over, I think, 20% of the circulating supply. And this is actually much lower than other cryptocurrency proof of stake um, cryptocurrencies. So I think the industry standard is 45 to 50%. With a lot of other cryptocurrencies such as Solana, Polkadot, Atom, these are up, you know, above sixty to eighty percent in total stake. So ETH is definitely way behind the curve in the amount of ETH that is being staked. So I really see this as um, more validation of Ethereum if it continue to, I guess, improve as a network and people continue to have a lot of faith in withdrawing. I continue to see that just um, continue to increase and you know towards that thirty plus percent. Not, I don't think it's going to take too long actually. Yeah, right. Because people are feeling more comfortable with it as uh, the, the merger's been going on for like over a year so far and people can see they can easily withdraw. But but Matt, uh, Nick, I've got another curious question from myself here. I'm curious, George, today. Um, what what In regards to ETH, is it actually risk-free when you start staking it? I know some people uh, uh, get into staking. They don't quite understand the infrastructure behind it. At Collective Shift, we do provide you a whole bunch of resources. So if you're interested, uh, come to Collective Shift and find out. But my question is, Nick, is ETH staking risk-free? Yeah, this is a good question because often I hear people talk about a risk-free rate, you know, that Ethereum could potentially be in this staking. Um, and they sort of make a comparison against the um, sort of the US, you know, treasuries rate and that sort of the ETH is going to be that risk-free staking rate, which is definitely not true. I think that's one of the biggest myths out there that, um, you know, there are, you know, significant risks that can come such as, uh, validators that may be acting uh, inappropriately if you are delegating your ETH to, ETH to them or staking with them, you know, then if they uh, behave badly, your ETH could be at risk. We also have smart contract risk. So Lido is the biggest smart contract sort of uh, staking provider in the ecosystem. But of course, if something happens to their smart contracts and something goes wrong, your ETH, you know, could potentially be at risk. So there's a lot of sort of bug risk, security risk. And then again, just overall risk of ETH as a cryptocurrency too, that can be underestimated. So there's uh, definitely risk out there to consider and reasons why, you know, it's um, definitely encouraged, you know, to not go the whole hog and um, think that all, you know, you should just stake your ETH and, you know, because nothing bad's going to happen, but because you know, there are definitely some smaller risks out there. Hmm, maybe that's a good indicator why there's only 20% of ETH staked at the moment, rather than, you know, 80% or 60% similar to Solana, Polkadot, Cardano. Well, awesome, man. Thank you, Nick, for uh, uh, providing those details. And if you are a listener out there, we do have the Security Center at Collective Shift where you can come and find out more about ETH staking and look at what the risks are because it's not uh, risk-free. You know, you, nothing is ever risk-free. Um, but I'll leave it there, my friends. Let's talk about the UK. Um, I'm going to go to Matt uh, on this, but the UK's financial services and markets bill uh, have come to regulate the crypto sector. UK is kind of turning into a crypto hub, quote unquote. But Matt, uh, do you, what news do you have on this? Do you think it's significant at all? What's happening in the UK for this? Yeah, last week, the um, yeah, UK's financial services and markets bill uh, was was passed and yeah, signed off uh, and ratified into law. So yeah, it's, uh, that bill is to regulate basically the crypto sector um, and sort of the trading of different cryptocurrencies uh, sort of allows for sort of sandboxes often used in a legal sense for just, you know, new innovative areas to experiment in, in a sort of regulated way um, or within the parameters of the law. Uh, so yeah, allows for more, I guess, you know, tinkering with different use cases of blockchain uh, and it, yeah, essentially formalizes the UK's treatment of stable coins as a form of payment as well. So we've seen this for a while, slowly, the UK slowly warming up towards crypto. And I think the stars have sort of aligned for them in the sense that the US's hostility or recent hostility towards the sector and asset class, you know, is really, you know, aligned with this, this, you know, bill becoming law. Uh, and it's really, I suppose, you know, almost put UK up on a pedestal along with some other jurisdictions uh, for those, I suppose, US-based companies to consider moving to uh, if, if the situation continues in the US. 
Yeah, definitely. We're talking about ge geographic arbitrage where people can move their entire businesses and go to another country if the SEC is being too hostile. Now, what could be the impact on the US if this kind of geographic arbitrage does happen? Could we see people actually leaving the US? Matt, do you think that could actually happen? Uh, I think, you know, on, on the boundaries, yeah. I think, you know, if, if people are, you know, worried enough or, or I suppose their, their lifestyle circumstances are such that, that they're happy to move overseas, um, I still think, you know, majority of, of, you know, US, you know, founders and whatnot will, will stay in the US, but that'd be a very extreme case where, you know, they're sort of, it's an exodus, um, you know, whether it gets to that, I personally don't think it will, but it's a possibility. Um, but yeah, I think for these jurisdictions or countries like the UK, I think they're using this as an opportunity to almost pitch themselves to either even just, yeah, US-based companies in particular, but, but more broadly, just, you know, the, the global sort of cryptocurrency industry, uh, which has, you know, grown significantly in the past years. Yeah, and we also have some pressure on Gary Gensler there over in his office. He, he might be feeling some pressure now. There was some uh, un, unsourced, unverified rumors going around that he handed in his resignation. Now, over at Collective Shift, we want to make sure we provide you with the most recent and accurate sources. So I'm just going to say, no, don't listen to that. It's not official at all. So don't get freaked out. So uh, yeah, people are saying, oh, Gary Gensler's feeling a bit of pressure here and there. But hey, that's a government job. There is lots of pressure everywhere. Um, let's move on, my friends. Let's talk about Binance. Binance has been in the news a lot recently in crypto. Now, it's actually facing an upward hurdle, uh, especially in Europe right now. Not only are they being sued by the SEC in America, they're also having a tough go in Europe. So, Matt or Nick, I might think it would be Matt as well. Can you give us the update on what's happening with Binance in Europe? Uh yeah, I'm happy to take this one because uh, it's, uh, I think, something really important because uh, it's one of the biggest cal downside catalyst risks in the market, what's going on with Binance. So we saw over the last couple of weeks that they've sort of had issues in and around a lot of different European countries. So one of the big headlines here was that Binance sort of lost uh, one of their European banking partners. Uh, this is uh, kind of goes on to what we've seen in the US where they lost one or two other banking partners. Uh, and then this is, isn't just exclusive to this one example, but maybe what I'm seeing is part of a wider trend of, you know, countries are being a bit more hostile to Binance or, you know, Binance really struggling to get these licenses and get this approval to operate in these countries. So this is um, another example, I think, through the Netherlands, you know, who are being a bit hostile to Binance. We saw um, Austria um, and a UK, although they sort of, weren't banned or anything like that. They just sort of withdrew some of their licenses to operate there. And then we saw in like other countries such as Canada, a similar news. And the latest one here was Belgium, where I think the Belgium market regulator um, in late June uh, forced Binance or indicated that they have to halt their services. So I think this is part of a really wider trend in the market. And it's not just a one-off. So whenever I see something in conjunction of um, in a wider picture here, I think there's definitely something something to there. And, you know, Binance is definitely struggling in Europe and, you know, these attitudes to uh, in different countries. Now, now, Nick, speaking about Binance, they're one of the biggest market players in, in the entire crypto space, right? So why does this actually matter? Why do we care if Binance has this uh, massive fight with the European government or with the SEC? Why, why do we care? I, I think in my in my opinion, because they hold uh, about, well, they used to hold a much higher market share, although that market share has dwindled since uh, late last year and all this Binance uncertainty has arose. But, you know, I think if a lot of these regulators are seeing potentially something um, not nefarious, but um, perhaps they're not doing all the right checks and balances, that these regulators are coming up and halting them and not approving them for operations, then it's potentially saying sort of what are they seeing there that is stopping them, um, their confidence in Binance. So I think that's a really strong signal that perhaps these regulators aren't sure about Binance, that maybe there's something else there that the rest of the market may not know. Hmm. Well, awesome, man. Uh, as always, we'll keep you guys up to date. If there's anything we think you need to know, we will let you know. And we'll also just take a second to thank all you listeners out there. If you're listening on the podcast, if you're listening on YouTube, Thank you very much for being with us. Make sure you leave a like and subscribe for us, as well as uh, leave a comment in the description. I want to know what news you're listening to this week. Now, let's move on to our next topic, which is the rapid fire or anything that has been 
overappreciated or underappreciated in the market. Now, I know, Matt, you've been, you're deep into NFTs. I know you've got a few yourself. Don't hide it. Uh, I want to know what's happened with the NFT um, um, uh, news this week. Tell us, mate. Yeah, probably one of the biggest stories for the year happened last week in the NFT space, um, which like all cryptocurrencies has been, you know, falling you know, significantly uh, this this year, the past 18 months, really. So this, this project's called Azuki. Uh, and, you know, the team behind that essentially raised nearly 40 million uh, US dollars uh, by launching a secondary or, well, actually a tertiary sort of collection. Um, and, yeah, essentially, yeah, the, the reaction from the community was, yeah, very, very negative. Um, just it, as another example of poor execution. Uh, so, you know, with investing, there's a bunch of risks with, with anything, let alone cryptocurrencies and NFTs. One of those is always execution risks. So can, can the thing I'm, can the team responsible for what I'm investing in, can they actually execute on what they're promising? Um, this is sort of, this execution risk has proved to be very relevant to the NFT space in particular, probably similarly to the ICO era of 2017 where there was a lot of promises by the founding teams that sort of initially developed the the thing, the app, the protocol. Um, and can they execute on that? Many of them proved they didn't have the technical ability to do so or whatever they were building couldn't find product market fit. Similarly, we're seeing the exact same thing here in NFTs. Um, so yeah, it's really plagued the whole NFT space. So I think the significance of this to you know really be brief was Azuki was probably one of the last teams left, if not the last team in this category of sort of profile picture avatar NFTs, which is by far the biggest category in the whole NFT space. They were yeah, arguably the last team left that had not yet um, had a misstep in terms of technical execution. Like they hadn't done a poor job on any release or anything. Um, and this, this was a, a, a big blunder by them. So the whole NFT market over the past you know, three, four days has really um, fallen heavily, even more so than what it has this year. So, you know, I guess takeaway is that probably my takeaway is that it's still bottoming the NFT market uh, as opposed to probably cryptocurrencies and, and even more so Bitcoin and ETH, which I feel very confidently have bottomed um, for the other altcoins. Not sure yet. Uh, and for NFTs, even more, I guess, degree of uncertainty whether they've bottomed yet because we're still seeing you know, heavy, heavy um, market reactions to negative news, which we don't see in crypto today. Yeah, mate, that's quite upsetting, isn't it? They were one of the biggest NFT profiles, uh, you know, projects in the ecosystem. And they were like, they were going so well for a while, but uh, you got to bring it down to reality. Mm. No one's perfect. The team is still trying to figure it out just like everyone else. Um, and unfortunately, it didn't quite work out the way they planned this time. But doesn't mean they can't come back stronger, right? They're still around. They're still working. Um, yeah, it's upsetting. It's, yeah, it's possible. Um, so, it, so, yeah, it's possible. But then, uh, yeah, I think also just, Probably a reminder for everyone with with the risks of anything. Um, there's yeah. just, I guess, I guess we've got a lot of resources the on more complexity to, to that give you a lot of the breakdowns of different risks because there's so many varieties in in any investing, let alone NFTs and crypto. And I think we That's have right. some good material on there, which really helps you understand um, more, I guess, nuanced perspectives. And execution risk is definitely one that's super relevant. Uh, but as you said, Leon, they could come back. Time will tell. But definitely a lot of lot of uh, holders out there that have been hurting the, the year to date. So hopefully they weren't too overly exposed. But uh, yeah, we'll see. Mm. Yeah, mate, we'll have to see. Like, yeah, and I totally understand what you're saying. There's different risk profiles between tokens, NFTs, PFP pictures. You got to understand this, not just the the security side of things, but the actual execution. So, Matt, thanks a lot for uh, sharing that. Uh, I, I do like the Azuki art myself, so <laughs> I should follow that. Now, now, Nick. Um, so Matt is into NFTs this week. Nick, what are you into in uh, the blockchain ecosystem? Uh, yeah. So my sort of thing that I thought like was underappreciated was a discussion around Coinbase's uh, L2 mainnet. So they've come out um, in a few other Coinbase events and they said that they could potentially see a their L2, their sort of scaling solution that is helping to extend you know, the, the practicality and usage of Ethereum that could potentially come within 60 days. So who knows if they were being too overexcited at these events, uh, but 
I, I wouldn't be too surprised if we don't see a main net within the next three months because they've sort of hit another major milestone uh, on their way to a main net. And they've had over about, I think, 100 external security researchers sort of identify and mitigate potential risks. So they're very much now in the final testing and security phase of the um, of the main net. So I'm really excited to see um, how long this testnet takes. And I think we're going to really see some big moves from Coinbase. And I think it's going to really start to potentially uh, have a lot more focus on um, Ethereum in the next couple of months when we start to see one of the biggest public companies in the space, you know, have an official Ethereum mainnet, um, tied mainnet. Now, I'm very curious, Nick, when BASE does come out, will you be making some member exclusive articles for the Collective Shift members out there? I want to know. Uh, for sure, because um, I think we've even um, shared bits and pieces because at the moment it's just in testnet. But, you know, I, I can't see why Coinbase's L2 won't potentially challenge Arbitrum and Optimism as one of the biggest you know, Ethereum scaling solutions out there. Oh, sounds good, mate. Thank you so much. I'm looking forward to reading it. Um, and I guess my last thing I'll share, uh, Matt is into NFTs, Nick is into Coinbase and their mainnet release. I'm into games, my friend. Uh, you've probably heard of Ubisoft. They are a staple name in uh, uh, gaming. Uh, they released Assassin's Creed even. So they just teased a new Web3 game. Uh, it's not a browser-based game, so don't worry. It's a PC native game. It kind of has some kind of compatibility through tokens and quote, free drop this is to make sure they to, like kind of token gate the first people that come in now it does give off a tabletop figurine kind of style so we're looking at the dungeons and dragons vibe and we all know how dedicated that fan base can really be to those D, &D players uh, it's, it can be really addicting and really fun that's what's really been missing from web 3 right it's the fun game we don't have a fun game so far so will they prove to be a fun web 3 game uh ubisoft uh, assassin's creed has been really good so far we're going to have to wait and find out. Uh, they have a good track record, but as I said, we'll wait and see. Uh, there is a small minor interesting note I did notice, though. It's the blockchain that they've actually decided to launch this new game on. It's actually on the Oasis blockchain. Um, they are slightly on the lower end of like the blockchain spectrum. Then You don't see them very easily on CoinMarketCap. Um, but they have been tagged by Sega as well as Square Enix for blockchain gaming. So I think that's really interesting. It's probably time to start looking into the Oasis network and Oasis blockchain as to why all these companies, these Web2 gaming giants are deciding to launch there. Very interesting, right? I think that leaves us to the end of the uh, podcast this week. That's a wrap for this week, of course. If you're looking for more insights, make sure you check out our revamped weekly shift newsletter. It provides free market insights every Friday. Subscribe at collectiveshift.io forward slash newsletter. That's collectiveshift.io forward slash newsletter. We will see you next week.